Good afternoon. Today we're at an Italian car show. Classic, I think, mainly. Well, Italian anyway. It's good fun. Jasper is obviously loving it because, you know, it's cars. Anyway, it's all good fun. It's not what we're gonna talk about here today. No, I wanna talk about SpaceX and the new Block 5 rocket that they have just flown for the first time. This is a Falcon 9, but it is, apart from a few sort of minor tweaks, the final iteration of the Falcon 9. The principal change between block 5 of Falcon 9 and all the previous versions of it is that this one should finally be able to achieve aviation like levels of reusability at least in terms of the first stage booster. It should be able to fly I think about 10 missions with minimal to no refurbishment and then it sort of goes in for a full service and hopefully comes out for another 10 after that. I think they said it could potentially do up to a hundred missions per rocket, I think. A massive step forwards. Also, while we're on the subject of SpaceX, I'm gonna show you a little bit of what I've been up to with this whole Kerbal Space Program thing, because it seems pertinent. And I have learned a lot from Kerbal. I think maybe we should do that a little bit later, because, yeah. I mean, I've been a little bit naughty. I came out from the car show to talk to you guys. I really should get back, so, I will see you when we get back home. Okay, so the thing about reusability and block five and the reason why I'm so excited and also how that ties in with Kerbal Space Program. I mean, basically, Kerbal Space Program is kind of, because it's a reasonably accurate simulation, there are certain things which you can get to grips with, with it and you can sort of properly comprehend, which otherwise you wouldn't have a clue about. I always wondered why there was such a thing about using the moon as a refueling base. You know, they got so excited when they found ice in a crater at the moon a few years back and there was talk about, oh, we can use it to, you know, synthesize rocket fuel and refuel our ships. And I was thinking to myself, hang on a minute, that sounds incredibly hard work. You know, building a base on the moon, and then building an industrial refinery for f rocket fuel, and then getting the rocket fuel up to some ship, or having the ship land and then it refuels and then it goes on, wouldn't it just be easier to just launch a bit of extra fuel and send that instead? And if you had a fully reusable launch system, then that would probably be the better way to go, which is the Elon Musk approach. However, having played Kerbal, I now understand the magic that is being able to refuel from a really low gravity celestial body. Because, and it's that low gravity bit which is key because it means you can refuel and then get that fuel up into space into orbit and it uses virtually none of the fuel you, you refined to get it to space. Whereas the thing about from a higher mass body like say Earth, you're talking about using 95% of the fuel just to get to orbit. So you're only gonna have 5% left best case scenario. To refuel a rocket could take 10 launches, which is what they're talking about when they you know, talk about getting 150 tons to Mars using the BFR. Once you have reusability, you get a lot closer to what I call the just add energy scenario, which is what you want with anything, including cars, actually. Oh, and while we're talking about the just add energy and maintenance and all the rest of it, open the back of my car today and I'd swear a bucket worth of water came out of the back boot. So there's obviously something that's you know, some seal that's gone and the whole of the back, you know, the, the rear lift gate of the car is just filling with water and, you know, I'm gonna have to get that looked at. So I'm gonna be ringing Tesla tomorrow and getting that booked in, which is great, because I love visiting Tesla. Pretty much sure this car is the car I've done the most miles in so far. 
Um, I did a lot of miles in my 306, but I had a lot more problems in those miles, and I didn't do 95,000 miles in that anyway. I think I did about 80. Anyway, let's crack on, have a quick look at Kerbal Space Program after I've gone and had supper. There's a yummy pasta dinner. Pasta, of course, had to be pasta. Um, right. Now, just one little caveat. Kerbal Space Program does not play that quickly on my laptop anyway, and I have no idea how quickly it's going to work if I'm recording what's on the screen as well. I suspect not very, but oh well. Maybe I'll speed it up or something. Try and make it more watchable. Let's do this. Word of warning, I have not tried this kind of video before, so I will probably suck at it. There we go, that's my disclaimer out of the way. Now let's do it. So, Kerbal, it's a bit like Minecraft in space. This is the space center. You've got usual buildings, tracking station, vehicle assembly, research building, astronaut complex, space plane hangar, launch pad of course, mission control, that's that little one there. You get missions there and you can use those to bring funds in, because I'm in career mode, because why not? Right, let's have a quick look at a ship, maybe do a, a, a brief rocket launch in honor of Falcon 9's Block 5 debut. Very excited about that. So this is effectively a bit like my version of the Falcon 9 Block 5, but you know, different. I have got a bunch of mods installed, by the way. So this is Kerbal Inventory System, I've got Kerbal Attachment System, I've got Mech Jeb, I've got Thruster Controlled Avionics, I've got Crew Manifest, I think that's about it, and I've got some construction parts as well. Oh, and Kerbalized SpaceX as well. Mainly because I really like their big ass landing gear. You don't get big landing gear with the stock game, and you can get by with the small landing gear, but the big one looks better. And let's launch it. Can't have any crew, because there aren't any crew available. They're all in space already. I usually launch stuff with Mech Jeb, just because it makes life quicker and easier, and I can go make a coffee while it launches my really big rockets. Um, this is just a little one. I decided to do this one manually, hence the sort of wobbling. Actually the other reason for the wobbling is I've left a couple of docking port adapters between big and small docking ports and they're still in there and they're not properly strutted up so it's just the payload is wobbling about it's causing the whole thing to be unstable but you know we got to space. I was talking a little bit so we went a bit over my target 100 kilometers up but oh well. <laughs> what I like about Kerbal is it's basically a physics simulation where you get to really experience some of the weird things that go on with orbital mechanics. Because sometimes you think you're going to go forwards because you fired your thrusters forwards, but actually you wind up going up. You know, things are, are very, they're not as you would expect always when it comes to space. It's not an environment that most people have any familiarity with or, or how it works. And it does help actually when you know SpaceX are talking about things like coast phases to understand why they're coasting. What are they doing? They're, they're waiting until they reach that apoapsis because at that point, the highest point in the, ap in the orbit, the apogee, they can fire their engines and circularize into that higher orbit, which is exactly what I just did. All right, now it's time to deploy our payload. I'm not really bothered about it. And you see those docking port adapters right at the back there. They caused all the trouble. Um, I needed them. A bit of an oversight in one of the other ships that I launched. Um, but yeah, this is this little thing's actually pretty decent. It's got a reasonable amount of delta V, almost 1500, depending on what kind of payload you put in it. It's very manoeuvrable and uh, just generally very good. It's also capable of re-entering Kerbin's atmosphere all on its own and coming to a controlled landing, more or less, at a specified place. Anyway, let's leave this alone now and uh, get our rocket back, because just like Falcon 9, this baby can land itself. Well, that's not true, but it can land, so that's the important thing. Okay, right, air brakes out. So have a quick look. We're going to try and get it roughly at the space center. 
Uh, I'm not sure how well I'm going to do about that. Actually, I, I know how well I did not well. And the reason I did not well was because I was thinking whilst playing this about what I was going to talk about right now. So anyway, I fire my engines retrograde to slow me down and to the atmosphere. I turn so that the engines are pointing into the air. That's uh, facing retrograde as opposed to prograde, which is facing in the direction you're going. And I zoom along and then I start to think, oh, hang on a minute, I'm really high. I'll fire the engines. I did that way too early. Hence why, you know, the space center's on the far side of that big bit of land that I'm not going to get over. So it looks like we're going into the sea. Oh, well. There's that lovely SpaceX landing gear. Big fan of that. Okay, cool. And a bunch of parachutes all overlapping each other, but they still slow you down, which is good. A little bit of thrust just to take the edge off the uh, eventual landing. And then it tips over in the sea, which it very rarely does, actually, because usually I'm paying attention and doing things properly. Oh, well. That's why I'm not keeping this save game. I just thought to have a bit of a play whilst showing you some of what's going on here. Right, we're gonna, this must be block five landing gear, by the way, because it can retract itself. The reason why the block five Falcon 9 can retract its landing gear is because in the past, you had to unbolt the stuff. It took hours, it was more work. Anyway, I've recovered 88% of the value of that craft. Now, let's have a quick look. So this is the Kerbin system. You've got Duna, which is kind of like their version of Mars. You've got Eve, their version of Venus. And I've got a couple of really big interstellar craft that I've built. Now these things have a humongous amount of delta V. This thing is towing 500 tons of refueling drone and it still has two and a half thousand delta V. And that's a fully loaded refueling drone. So I will actually probably move some of the fuel into the main ship just as it approaches Duna because it doesn't need that much. The actual drone doesn't. Okay, just turn it around a bit. It's actually reasonably responsive when you speed the video up. When I play it, I'm getting like four frames a second out of this, even when I'm not recording the screen. So it's a bit laggy. But you know what? You still you let you get the principle. You know, and you you learn what works and what doesn't with uh, space. Here is another one. These are big ships. I mean, this I think this one is like a thousand tons. The last one was two thousand tons. They're huge. This has got accommodation for a hundred Kerbals. And at the moment, it's about a quarter full of tourists. So I'm going to make lots of lovely money when they get home from their little tour of the Kerbal system. Ah, now this is my uh, biggest interplanetary ship with a refueling drone that has just refilled it. Well, half refilled it. What did I learn in a nutshell from Kerbal? Reusability is really, really handy. I didn't really bother with it until quite late in the game because in this game, you're talking about a planet. Uh, Kerbin has, I think, something like, I don't know, a tenth of the mass of Earth. It's, it's significantly less. So space is at 70 kilometers, not 100 kilometers and it's much easier to reach escape velocity and you know circularize into orbit and to basically do everything. Low mass celestial bodies are fantastic, really brilliant, which is why I now understand the excitement about mining asteroids and mining the moon. It's not because we're gonna be getting some fantastically amazing valuable resource out of the ground in and of itself, it's that that resource in that place is worth a lot of money. Because if you've got resource, if you've got a thousand gallons of you know, rocket fuel on the surface of the moon, you only need to use probably about 90 gallons of that to get it into orbit of the moon. Whereas to get it from Earth, a thousand or 950 odd gallons of rocket fuel, from Earth all the way out to moon orbit, you'd use probably about 995 of those gallons of, of rocket fuel. So there'd be nothing left. You'd have to put a huge amount of effort in to get it up there. 
So that's why it's valuable, because it's come from a low gravity body, so it's easy to get it into space, it's easy to take it somewhere. All these things are things which I'm now relatively familiar with, whereas before, I, you know, I had a rough idea, but I didn't really understand. Somebody was asking a question on another YouTube channel uh, as to whether you could throw a ball and have it and deorbit it. So you're on the International Space Station, you throw a ball, can you get that to actually deorbit? The answer being, no, you can't. You know, if you threw it retrograde, so you threw it backwards, you would be slowing the ball down, but you wouldn't slow it down enough that it would touch the atmosphere. Getting to space is all about speed. Really, it has virtually nothing to do with altitude. Altitude is to do with staying in space because if you're in the atmosphere, you're gonna slow down because of friction, and once you slow down below orbital speed, you're gonna drop. Whereas, when you're in space, all you need is that speed, which is why rockets tilt themselves over and do what's called a gravity turn as soon as they possibly can. As soon as they're out of the thickest bit of the atmosphere, they start piling on the horizontal speed, because that is what getting to space is all about. Watching SpaceX launched the Falcon 9 Block 5, it almost felt like it should have been more of an event. But I'll tell you what will be an event, is when they launch one rocket twice in 24 hours, which hopefully Elon Musk said in the uh, pre-launch press brief that um, hoping to do that maybe a couple of times next year. That would be amazing, I would love to see that. And that would really prove the critics wrong, which, you know, I'm a big fan of proving critics wrong. Okay, I think that's about all I've got time for today because I have now got to take Jasper and get him bathed, get him to bed. It's school tomorrow, you get the idea. I hope you've enjoyed today's video. Found it fun and entertaining. If you have, remember to like it, share it, subscribe if you haven't already, follow me on Instagram if you don't already, and I'll see you tomorrow for the next installment of my vlog, which I still want to be daily one day. We're working on it. Bye. Okay, uh, first thing I need is the screen recording software. Right. I don't know how I'm going to shoot this. I think what I might do is I'll have a bit of a tour and then I'll talk about what I've recorded. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs>